Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Lees from Central New Mexico Community College. This is video A of the endocrine system. And as you know, the endocrine system covers the hormones and the glands that produce the hormones. Now, in all of these other organ systems that we've covered so far, of course we've covered almost all of them already by now, we've come across at least one hormone per organ system, usually more than one. Well, in this chapter, we're going to put all of these hormones together, plus add a whole bunch more. But more importantly, we're going to learn more about the glands that secrete them, and why they're secreted, and how they're secreted, and what the mechanisms are of action, etc., etc. So here goes. Both the nervous system and the endocrine system play a very important role in communication between cells in the body. But the endocrine system really allows for long-distance intercellular communication. As you know, the endocrine system is made up of endocrine glands. And just as a refresher, remember there are endocrine glands and exocrine glands in the body. But the endocrine glands are always ductless. And they secrete hormones. Now, these hormones are typically secreted into our blood or even into the lymph. Uh, sometimes just into the interstitial fluid surrounding the cells. And each one of these hormones, just like the neurotransmitters of the nervous system, have very specific receptors. These receptors are located on cells we refer to as target cells, or the organ on which these targets, target cells are located we may refer to as the target organs. This table summarizes nicely uh, the main differences and the main similarities be between the endocrine and the nervous system. Both of them are major communication systems, but if we take a look at the distance traveled, then notice that the endocrine system can travel, can allow for communication across long distances. At times it's also a very short distance, and we'll see why that might be. For the nervous system, it's always a very short dis distance, either by, by means of these um, chemical synapses that we've learned about in the past, or the electrical synapses that, that we've studied, for instance, in the case of the heart. In the case of the endocrine system, the mechanism is always going to be a chemical signaling mechanism. With hormones as our chemical messengers, while in the nervous system, of course, they are neurotransmitters. Usually the endocrine system responds uh, much slower than the nervous system. But again, it depends on where and how far away the target is uh, of the hormone. And if it's very close by, we might see a faster response. There's additional factors that determine that. The environment that's targeted for the endocrine system is also always the inside of the body or part of the body, while the nervous system can be targeting the external environment as well. Think of how we respond to an external stimulus and how we can therefore um, impact the environment around us by the kind of reflex we might have um, in response to that stimulus. Let's take a look at some of the major endocrine glands starting in the head. Now, this picture out of your OpenStax book has an error in my opinion, so let's fix this. So the thalamus is not a major endocrine organ, but the hypothalamus is, which sits approximately right here. So let's replace that with hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to control the pituitary gland, which we see right here. Now, on the other side of the diencephalon, on the posterior aspect of the diencephalon right here, we have another gland called the pineal gland, which is part of the epithalamus. Remember the structures you learn about in the brain. At the level of the throat, covering the thyroid cartilage, we see our thyroid gland, which is a bilobed structure. And if we were to be able to look at the back side or the posterior side of the thyroid gland, we would see the parathyroid gland. So they've illustrated those here as four little circles, but keep in mind they're on the posterior side of the thyroid gland. These parathyroid glands can also be distributed throughout the chest area. So they're not in all of us limited to just the back side of the thyroid gland. Sitting on top of the kidneys, we have our two adrenal glands. 
Sometimes they are referred to as the supra renal glands, and I'm sure you can translate what that means by now. Let's not forget the pancreas, major source of insulin, of course. When we get to the reproductive system, we will study the gonads and some of the other hormone secreting structures in the female we would need to consider both the uterus, but especially, of course, the ovaries. And in the males, we have the testes to consider. Finally, there's also the thymus, which we tend to think of as being primarily part of the immune system. But the thymus also secretes a hormone, hormone called thymosin. Thymosin, though, is not produced by just the thymus. It was first discovered in the thymus, but it's produced by many, many different uh, cells. And it's a hormone with, and there's very, various forms of the hormone, and they have many different functions, uh, which I'm not going to discuss any further. So these are typically the glands, the endocrine glands, that we think of uh, when we think of the endocrine system. But... By now you realize that so many other structures in our body produce hormones. And, and as a matter of fact, really every cell in the body produces some kind of hormones. Some people feel that our digestive tract is actually the largest hormone secreting structure in the body. Think of the various hormones that we've learned about. I've just listed a few there. Don't forget your kidneys as well. They produce erythropoietin and renin to start the renin-angiotensin mechanism. Your skin, your skin starts the process of vitamin D. Really, we should probably add the vitamin D to the kidneys rather than the skin, but the skin starts the process. Your heart is even an endocrine organ producing atrionatriuretic peptide or factor, the placenta, in a pregnant mother produces human chorionic gonadotropin, which we're not going to go into uh, in this chapter. Adipose tissues produce a hormone called leptin, and many, many, many more hormones are out there, produced by many, many different structures, and as I stressed before, basically all cells are hormone-secreting structures. So what do these chemical messengers that we call hormones really do? Well, for one, they, they help with the maintenance of homeostasis by changing the rate of metabolic processes. And what are some examples of metabolic processes that, um, that could be influenced by these hormones? Well, the permeability of a cell with the opening or closing of ion channels and that then can impact the resting membrane potential. Now, this sounds very similar to neurotransmitters. And indeed, hormones and neurotransmitters can sometimes do pretty much the same thing. Hormones can change the uh, rate at which protein synthesis occurs in a cell. And which enzymes should become activated or deactivated. They can trigger the secretion of uh, glandular secretions, that is exocrine glandular secretions, for instance, and they can impact mitotic divisions such that um, more cells are produced. So hormones are chemical messengers that can travel a far distance, such as via the blood or the lymph, and then we call that type of signaling endocrine signaling. So that's kind of what you're used to thinking of um, when you think of a hormone. But sometimes hormones don't travel that far. And perhaps you did think about this or, or wonder about this in the digestive tract when we talked about the stomach secreting gastrin and then the gastrin impacting the stomach's own cells. So when we see that the, the, the impact of the hormone is rather localized, then we refer to that type of signaling as paracrine signaling. So it's more of a localized signaling, sometimes via the blood, but often via the interstitial fluid. An even more localized form of signaling by hormones is called autocrine. And in this case, let's say we have our cell here, and this cell produces a hormone X, 
here's our hormone X, and it act, actually has on its own cell membrane a receptor to which X can bind. So the hormone produces, I'm sorry, the cell produces a hormone that binds to that very same cell, autocrine, self-signaling. Some of the interleukins are considered to be self-signaling hormones. Finally, we have the neurocrine type of signaling. In this case, hormones are going to impact the release of neurotransmitters by neurons, and vice versa, this can be the case as well. You're already quite familiar with the situation of a neuron impacting the release of hormones. Think of the sympathetic nervous system. Recall that the autonomic nervous system, of course, that's the, the, the sympathetic nervous system belongs to the autonomic nervous system, is always made up of two consecutive motor neurons. Um, and in the case of the sympathetic nervous system, there is a situation where the second neurons are actually modified neurons and part of the adrenal medulla. So if I quickly sketch here an adrenal medulla, kind of like here's the adrenal glands, kind of shaped more or less like that. And then we have the inside here of the adrenal medulla of the adrenal gland. I'll just fill it in. So these cells here, these adrenal medulla cells, remember they're the ones responsible for secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine where? Into the blood. But this preganglionic neuron, what does it do? It's going to secrete neurotransmitters, namely acetylcholine, onto the cells of the adrenal medulla. And that triggers them to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. Of course, there are also some preganglionic sympathetic fibers that, just like in the parasympathetic nervous system, synapse with postsynaptic fibers that release uh, norepinephrine most of the time. But we're looking here at an example of a neurocrine signaling mechanism, and this right here, your sympathetic fibers, preganglionic fibers, Trigger, triggering the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood um, from the adrenal medulla is a perfect example of neurocrine signaling. By the way, don't forget that the sympathetic cell bodies are always located where? They're always located in the spinal cord, right? More specifically, the thorac thoracic as well as the lumbar region, which is why the sympathetic nervous system is often called the cranio, I'm sorry, the, thoras, the thoracolumbar um, nervous system. This wraps up our introduction to the endocrine system. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the different groups of hormones that exist.